Another Republican lawmaker is facing criticism for comparing COVID-19 restrictions to the Holocaust. Ohio Congressman Warren Davidson has since apologized for this tweet, which he posted last week. It includes a picture of ID papers from the time when Nazis were in control of Germany. He was responding to Washington, D.C.'s new rules, which require proof of vaccination to enter public places. And Davidson isn't the only one who's been criticized for these kinds of comments. Last year, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene compared mask mandates to Nazis requiring Jews to wear the Star of David. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert and Congressman Madison Cawthorn have also drawn similar parallels. I want to bring in Jonathan Greenblatt to talk about this now. He is the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, Jonathan, welcome back to CBSN. Good to see you. Good to see you guys again, too. So, so for people who, after all these years, after all of this time, they're the, his, the, the education that you would assume that most people have in understanding what happened during uh, the time of the Third Reich. Explain, once again, why these comparisons are wrong. Yeah, it is quite stunning that 70 years after the systematic extermination of European Jewry, people seem to forget how singular and sinister that terrible tragedy was. It was perpetrated by people who not only demonized Jewish people, they regarded them as subhuman, and they conducted literally a campaign of extermination across the entire continent of Europe, North Africa, and it would have been worldwide. So to compare having to show that you've been vaccinated to walk into a restaurant to the Nuremberg laws that regarded my grandfather and millions of other European Jews, again, as subhuman, is, you know, it's historically inaccurate and it's horribly offensive. Now, the challenge is that people seem to feel the need to politicize memory, to weaponize the Holocaust for political gain. I think, you know, whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene or Representative Boebert or Madison Cawthorn, and some of the others you mentioned, who've done it and not apologized, not acknowledged the grievous error, which is so offensive, not only to the six million Jews, right, but to the millions of others who also were killed by the Nazi death machine. And so, again, like, literally having to show that you've been vaccinated to go into a restaurant or having to make sure that your children are vaccinated so they don't infect other kids is has nothing to do with wearing an armband or laws that, again, regarded Jews as subhuman. And it's really remarkable we're still having these conversations. So, you know, it, it's not always, it doesn't always have to do with COVID, and it, it's not always Republicans. Um, and I'll give you an example uh, from uh, 2019. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez compared border facilities run by the Trump administration to concentration camps. Uh, she got a lot of criticism. She stood by that comparison. And sort of later on, she tweeted, well, there's a difference between a concentration camp and a death camp. How are we to view those comments? I'm really glad you mentioned that. Neither side of the political spectrum is exempt from ignorance or intolerance. And the reality is yet yeah, just this week, we had a Democratic aspirant for governor in Florida compare Governor DeSantis to Adolf Hitler. I mean, come on. And again, I, we have spoken out, I personally have spoken out against the appalling treatment of migrants on our border. I think it's unconscionable to take children away from their parents. You know, and I've visited those the situation myself. I've seen those facilities where kids and teenagers were housed in chicken wire cages. I've seen it, I've talked to them. But to compare them to the Nazi death camps, I mean, it's twisted and it's wrong. So both Republicans and Democrats should not be trying to politicize the Holocaust, comparing Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump to Hitler, comparing Joe Biden uh, to Hitler, comparing Dr. Fauci to Dr. Goebbels. I mean, really, it's all madness. And I wish both sides would just stop, focus on facts, particularly at a time when our country is so divided, when our country is so polarized. It's incredibly unhelpful. 
And all it does is anger people rather than elucidate and help them understand what's really going on. So help us understand, uh, Jonathan, and our audience, w would you label this, this kind of rhetoric, this kind of talk as anti-Semitism? You know, when we talk about anti-Semitism, there are many who deny that the Holocaust happened. Again, this singular campaign to literally exterminate the Jewish people. So when you deny Jewish people the right to their own memory, the right to mourn their own six million, that is a form of bias. I would certainly call that anti-Semitism. And we see people both on the far right and the far left cheapen and uh, just desecrate the memory of the Holocaust saying it didn't happen or maybe it was less than they said. Honestly, you again, you see it from both sides. It is ugly and it is revolting. So Holocaust denialism or Holocaust distortionism, both of those are a form of trying to undermine the legitimacy of the Jewish people in our memory. And, you know, that's why at the ADL, look, we're focused on fighting anti-Semitism today, but to fight bigotry in this time, we need to understand the past. And, Jonathan, and we need to hold on to it, and that's why we talk about it. Yeah, and Anne Marie and Jonathan, you know, one of the things that I, I think about, which is why sort of in the introduction to you, Jonathan, I, I was sort of talking to myself about the education that we all receive, uh, those of us privileged to be educated in this country, uh, about the, the tragedies and the horrors um, that have come before. But, but what I always find fascinating, whether we're talking about, you know, you'll talk to people who will sometimes say, and politicians have said this, you know, well, back in, during, you know, the time of, of enslavement in this country, it wasn't so bad. You know, people had a place to sleep and people had food to eat. And you have to say to yourself, even if that was 150 years ago, there are people whose grandparents were enslaved. Um, how do you not understand that? In the case of the Holocaust, 70 years ago, there are people walking around this city and all over this country who were uh, put into those concentration camps who are still alive, albeit they're not that many, but they are out there. And certainly their children and their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren are here. So I don't understand how anyone can attempt to diminish the pain and suffering and the tragedy of any group of peoples um, by comparing it to something that is happening right now when we're all dealing with a public health crisis. Now, help me understand that. I think you just drew the analogy, like, again, when we hear people say slavery wasn't so bad, like, we know that there's a racism in that claim. And when we hear people say, literally, trying to undermine black people's experience, trying to undermine their history, as if you could deal, you could literally deny them the rights that they should have now by delegitimizing their history. That's what that is. Mm. And so when people say yeah, the Holocaust wasn't so bad, or when the Iranian regime in Tehran, right, literally funds, literally funds Holocaust denialism cartoons, like. We know, again, whether it's bias against the Jewish state or bias against the Jewish people, it's all a kind of hate against Jews. And it's just remarkable that, like, so in this moment, in this country, again, around COVID-19 precautions, people try to politicize that to, you know, for partisan gain vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration or whatnot. And I just think it is deeply, deeply amoral. Mm. Now, you can have strong opinions. You can contest the CDC's confusing guidelines. You could be upset about the way some of these mask mandates have been implemented. That's legitimate, I think. That's fair. But to do it by comparing to the, you know, the singular campaign to exterminate the Jewish people is so exaggerated, it's offensive. It's, and it's really just wrong. Jonathan, I want to ask you about the most recent high-profile example of violent anti-Semitism that, that we all watched unfold. Um, you did a webinar uh, with Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker. He is the rabbi that was held hostage inside that Texas synagogue, and he revealed some new details to you about what happened. I want to play some of that sound. He was talking about how he had a, you know, how he had a bomb and that he wanted the area cleared you know, because he didn't want civilians, you know, other people to get hurt. It was basically the notion that Jews were more important in his mind than everyone else, and that America would do more to save Jews than it would for anyone else. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why he specifically targeted a synagogue, right? That protocols of the elders of Zion uh, type of anti-Semitism. That's why he focused on us. And that's why he, uh, and, 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 and that's why we were put through that, that terrible ordeal. So during a briefing after the standoff, the Homeland Security Secretary told reporters that the U.S. is seeing a rise in hate speech and its connection to violence. I know that doesn't come as a surprise to you because we've talked about this uh, before a number of times. Um, how concerned are you about the rise in anti-Semitism in this country? Where do you think stand when it comes to anti-Semitism? Well, the ADL is the oldest anti-hate organization in America. I mean, we were founded in 1913. And we've been tracking anti-Semitic incidents, acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence since the 1970s. So we've been at this longer than anyone else. And I can tell you that the data doesn't lie, and it's deeply disturbing. After nearly a 15-year decline since 2001, the numbers spiked in 2016 by 37 <clears> percent. <throat> sorry, 34 percent. In, 20, in 2017, the numbers leapt 58 percent, the single largest increase we have ever seen. And that was the year of Charlottesville. In 2018, though, the numbers dipped by 5 percent, Anne-Marie. That was the year of Pittsburgh, the most violent anti-Semitic act in American history. In 2019, they increased 12 percent to give us the highest total ADL has ever tracked. And in 2020, despite the fact that we were all socially distancing and you know, businesses were shuttered and campuses were closed. The number was still the third highest total we have ever tracked. <clears throat> and then this past May, after the fighting in Gaza, we had Jews being attacked in broad daylight, being assaulted at restaurants, literally being mugged in Times Square. Their only crime wearing a kippah. Anti-Semitic incidents went up 115 percent in the month of May 2021 versus May 2020. So whether it's coming from far-right extremists and white supremacists and armed militia enthusiasts or far-left radicals who associate with the Palestinian cause <clears throat> or other kind of, you know, people following other bizarre ideas, Jews absolutely feel under siege. And the incident in Texas this past weekend only underscored it. I mean, this man came all the way from England to free an al-Qaeda operative ready to die. And he didn't do it, at, didn't think he would do it at a 7-Eleven. He didn't want to do it at a restaurant. He went to a synagogue because, as Rabbi Charlie said yesterday, those are his first public remarks since the tra tragedy. And we were blessed that he came to ADL because we trained him and he credited ADL with helping to save his life and that of the other hostages, as well as the FBI, a group called Secure Communities Network and some others. So we were glad to host him. But literally, he came to Charlie's synagogue because he thought Jews rule the world. Jews control everything. And so it's remarkable to see this kind of appropriation of all of the worst ideas, these conspiratorial plots that hold Jews liable for all of the world's ills. And that's why Jews are concerned. Now, I will tell you one thing. Tomorrow is Shabbat. Tomorrow is the day when Jewish people around the world will go to synagogue. And I can promise you this. Our synagogues will be filled to the brim tomorrow. Jews across all denominations all over the United States are going to show up in synagogue because although we are worried, we are resilient, we are determined, and we are not going to let anti-Semites, again, no matter where they fall on the spectrum, no matter what country they hail from, we are not going to let them daunt us. We're not going to let them keep us out of our sacred spaces. Duncan, before I let you go, you know, we've talked before about how sometimes events uh, around the world or domestically lead to spikes in anti-Semitism. But, you know, what you're talking about are spikes within an already sort of elevated level of anti-Semitism in this country. Before we spoke to you, we ran a story about a woman whose brother, a federal officer, w was killed. And she's suing Facebook's parent company because she feels that the social media platform paid a role in that murder because they, because the people who are accused of killing him organized online and they were suggested by Facebook to connect to each other, to follow each other. I want to ask you, how significant of a role do you think social media has played in this recent elevated level 
of, of anti-Semitism in this country? And Marie, that's a great question. I'm familiar with that case, and my heart goes out to that woman and her family. And you're right to raise the issue. If we try to understand, well, why is it worse, worse today? Well, we certainly have, like, again, per the earlier line of questioning, political figures who abuse memory, right? We have certain actors, <clears throat> again, from all sides who demonize the Jewish people and the Jewish state. But the thing that's different today about the past is social media. Facebook in particular, they have, it has 3 billion users. Literally, it is, the lar it is the most sophisticated advertising platform in the history of business. And unfortunately, it has become a cesspool of anti-Semitism and hate. It's taken the most malevolent ideas and allowed them to move from the margins right into the mainstream. And it's, you know, look, there's always been a lunatic fringe in this country. And that's part of the challenge of the First Amendment. You have to accept hateful speech. But the trick is, like it's on CBS, you keep the lunatic fringe on the fringe. You don't let them show up for interviews or editorials or PSAs. So, but unfortunately, Facebook doesn't exercise the same kind of moral judgment that you do, or that all other broadcast medium do, or print media, or audio media, and so on and so forth. We really need legislation to ensure that Facebook is held and all the social media companies are held to the very same standard that other forms of media, because the way extremists have exploited these platforms to spread hatred has real world consequences, the likes of which we're still dealing with today. Jonathan, this is uh, Emery, but uh, real quickly. Vlad, I think that's, I was just going to say, Vlad, that's a little bit an answer to your question that started off this whole conversation, right? How is it that we have all all this information that in our public schools, the Holocaust is taught. At this point, everyone knows about the pain, the loss, the, you know, everyone is aware of, of this sort of black mark on history. But the, the power of misinformation is in some cases overriding what we all know already to be true. Yeah, except that, except well, Jonathan, I was just going to ask it, 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 to, to sort of reinforce that, uh, that question, which is that somebody can still find, I don't know where, but I'm sure because it's out there, can still find the uh, Protocols of Zion or whatever that book is called, or whether that, that pamphlet is called. They can still find a, a print copy. They can still find one online. People can go and watch um, Birth of a Nation if they want. Um, and and those that film, um, the, that pamphlet, that book, whatever it is, uh, they have the same far-reaching effect um, maybe not with the speed of social media, but how do you, how, you know, if you can't stop a printer from publishing that book or someone from showing that film, how do you say to a company like Meta, the parent company of Facebook, y you can't allow this kind of language on your platform? I know it's a, I know we're talking big existential questions here, and we're going to fix the problems of this country, but, but I want to get your take, because it's such an interesting point. No. no, Vlad, you're right to ask. Like, again, these things are available in the real world today. So how can we expect that Meta or Twitter or these companies won't allow it? But, you know, to the question Anne-Marie was just asking, like young people, people today, like it or not, they're not reading the New York Times. They're getting their news from TikTok and Twitter. That, that should scare all of us. You know, literally, when Snapchat <laughs> has a larger audience than the broadcast networks combined, because you have editorial, you have editorial standards, you have... Uh, ombudsman, you have a whole set of policies and procedures. Like, there's none of that on, say, again, Facebook. So <clears throat> how do we deal with the situation? Well, here's what I would suggest. The library could carry the protocols of the, El the local library, the protocols of the elders design, but they decide not to do so because they don't think it fits their standards. You could buy Mein Kampf, maybe find that at the library, but you probably can't buy it at Barnes & Nobles because they decide not to carry it. Mm. Facebook has and Twitter and all of these platforms have the right to decide what they promote and elevate and what they simply don't. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing you could imagine is they already have their own standard, I'm sorry, terms of service. So when you sign up for an account on these platforms, you're not supposed to incite violence against minorities. You're not supposed to spread hate against marginalized groups. So at a minimum, they could simply hold their own users to the standards that they've already signed up to abide by but they don't do that. But beyond that, even if they're unwilling to apply their own terms of service, I mean, I can't imagine why they wouldn't, but let's just say, what they could simply do, Vlad and Anne-Marie, <clears throat> is they could contextualize 
these offerings. Like, for example, if you spread hate speech, we're not going to promote you with our algorithms. If you get a strike against you, we're going to take you off the platform permanently. If you're going to post a video, we're going to delay. I mean, there's no natural law that says a video that I post to YouTube should be should instantaneously be seen by the planet Earth. That's not like a law of gravity. You could slow it down by, I don't know, 10 seconds. So the AI can analyze it, assess whether there's hateful or violent content, kick it to a human person to review, and then post it 60 seconds later. Or guess what? Maybe 60 minutes later. I mean, this sounds hard, I know. This sounds complicated, but I think it's far more complicated to build a business that in 16 years builds a user base of 3 billion people and generates over $100 billion worth of revenue. I think that's a lot harder. Kicking some Nazis off your platform, that's pretty easy. Man, Jonathan Greenblatt, it's always uh, great talking to you. Uh, thank you so much. You guys are great. Thank you for covering this and have a great weekend.